down. Mm -hmm. I believe John is down the hall with the health care committee. Yep. Um, so, and Marcia had an appointment this afternoon. So, um, we're coming back to some testimony on H-464, um, and this is related to data collection and uh, de-escalation training model policy on sensitivity of cultural awareness in law enforcement. And um, because uh, there are oftentimes um, stories that really tug at the heart about uh, the interactions between law enforcement and uh, people experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, I wanted to invite a uh, representative of the Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, um, and also I believe that you are or were the uh, chair of the Brennan um, Commission. I, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so please come and help orient the committee, since they may not know who you are. All right. And. and uh, Thank you for being with us. Today. Thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate it. My name is Wilda White, and I am the former executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Uh, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors is a civil rights advocacy organization on behalf of people discriminated against because of mental illness. And I led that organization for three years, from 2015 through uh, 2018. Currently, I am the chair of the Vermont Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. And that commission was created uh, by legislature, uh, legislation of this body in 2017 um, as a result of uh, friends, families, and colleagues of Phil Grennan, who was killed in March of 2016 in his own home by uh, law enforcement officers from the Burlington Police Department. Uh, and of course, uh, it was captured on video, and that video was uh, released to the public, uh, and it caused a great deal of uh, trauma and consternation, uh, upset, uh, and I think that's what spurred people to want to do something to avoid these types of deaths, uh, or understand, first of all, uh, why it occurred and how to avoid it. I was on the um, ad hoc uh, group that got together. Uh, to see what could be done about it. And one of the things I noticed uh, was that uh, what people wanted to do about it very much depended on where they sat. So if you were a mental health practitioner, you wanted to do mental health. If you were uh, maybe a, a citizen who had problems with the police, you wanted to do police training. So uh, one of the things I pushed is, you know, before we go out and try to figure out what to do, why don't we try to figure out what happened? Um, and why don't we look at it more than just as what happened in that room, but see if there are kind of larger elements, larger issues um, that, uh, that brought us to this place where Mr. Grennan was hiding in his bathroom uh, and then ended up being killed by police. And so as a result, um, this commission was, was created. And I've been the chair of that commission uh, for the last uh, two years. And we have just completed our uh, review of that uh, encounter. And we expect the report to be released by the end of the month. Um, it's already been drafted. We're just proofreading at this point. <coughs> so um, I, um, you know, I've learned a lot from being on that commission. Uh, most, of the, most of the people in that commission are connected to law enforcement. Uh, there are there's, there's representatives of police chiefs. There are representatives of kind of rank and file. Uh, there's uh, representatives of the, the Criminal Justice Training Council. There's representative of Team Two. I don't know if you know what Team Two is, but it is the uh, collaboration between both uh, mental health providers and police, it's voluntary, but uh, several police agencies send their uh, officers to team true training. So the person who leads and heads up that is on the, com on the uh, commission. A uh, representative from Disability Rights Vermont, which is the organization that provides uh, legal services to people who've been um, uh, kind of caught up in the justice system on the civil side, not the criminal side. Uh, because of perceptions that they have mental illness. There's a representative of NAMI, which is an organization that represents family members of people who have uh, people with mental illnesses. And then I'm on there as a representative of uh, people with lived experience of mental illnesses. Um, and so, uh, you know, 
here's a, there's just this one kind of lone voice of people who've had experience with mental illnesses, and it was quite a, quite interesting to hear, um, just to see the difference in just looking at the same information and seeing how different people can uh, interpret that uh, same information depending on where they come from. But uh, I have to say that as um, disheartening as it has been at times, I feel that everyone on that commission has made a great deal of progress uh, and uh, seeing each other's points of view. Uh, and we've all moved. Um, I, I came in there with just kind of outrage that someone could kill somebody uh, in their apartment. A police, department, a police officer could kill someone in their apartment. And I was quite angry with those officers and, and sympathetic at the same time because I think it must be hard to kill somebody. Um, in, in your line of work. But I, I have seen the situation in, a, in, in very much a, a new light. Um, it, his death was completely preventable. Um, it should not have happened. Um, and one of the things I think is important for, your, for you as you consider this legislation is you have put kind of all your bags, all your eggs into the policy basket. Um, and I want you to know that uh, there are policies in play at this issue, in this in this encounter, that simply were not adhered to. Um, and these policies had been in existence for decades, and they simply were not adhered to. Um, so I would caution you, as you look at this legislation, to um, think more deeply about um, what it is you're trying to accomplish, and, and then how to go about accomplishing it. Because I can tell you that uh, a model policy is not going to get us where I think we want to go. Um, so the other thing that I think uh, about this policy is that I'm here to talk about mental health issues. And I notice that in your policy, you don't, it, it's silent on that. Um, you speak a lot about uh, racial um, <laughs> Uh, data collection, and um, but you don't talk about the uh, mental health, mental illness uh, part of it. And one of the things that you should know that kind of the people who are at the greatest risk of being killed by police officers are actually people with um, what they call untreated mental illnesses, and that's anybody who that's not simply somebody who's not seeing a doctor. Uh, that could be somebody whose uh, medication hasn't worked. That could be somebody whose uh, psychosis uh, was triggered by medication. Um, it's just somebody who's, uh, and so people with untreated mental illnesses are 16 times more likely to be killed by police. Uh, in Vermont, since Philip Brennan's death, we've already had five people killed by law enforcement officers who um, were thought to have been in a mental health crisis at the time of, uh, that they were killed. Um, so, if anything, I think this legislation needs to take account of that fact and include something to address that. Because one of the things I've learned from talking to police officers is they feel like they don't really have time for training. Um, they feel like, and they feel like they're at the point of being overtrained or too much training, or you know, the brain can't control, contain any more training. Um, and they seem very resistant um, uh, to training. Um, and, I don't, and I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's a bad motive or anything. I, I do think that they feel like every time they're in training or not in the field or. The training, I think, if, if they're so resistant to training, I think there must be something about the training that they don't feel like they're getting a whole lot out of it. So if you want to do the training route, um, I, I do hope that you include in it um, measures that both address uh, what, it, what the main um, topic of this legislation seems to be, which is use of force against people who aren't white, as I understand it. Um, but include in their training that also encompasses um, uh, training for um, preventing these deaths involving people and mental health crisis. So uh, instead of saying four hours for the type of training that's here, try to combine, right? try to get the um, 
whatever training it is to encompass all uh, use of force, no matter who the subject of it is, because I think you'll find that the police officer will be le much less resistant. And also, you'll be, um, I think, one of the things that will come out of our commission, um, and I don't think I'm telling tales out of school just because our report hasn't been released yet, but you know that report does recommend more training. And so I think we need to tr consolidate this training instead of having this commission recommend four hours, this commission recommend four hours. But you can consolidate it um, and um, and then avoid this complaint you're going to hear about there's, there's not enough time. Um, the other thing I find troubling about this piece of legislation is um, you've, you've designated the people whose views will be, who, who, you've, you've designated stakeholders um, who are supposed to be involved in creating this model policy. Um, but you haven't, uh, I don't know why you designate these particular people or why you think they have any particular expertise um, in this area. I know one of the things that um, you know, I've learned is that uh, and many times the people who are considered stakeholders, they don't know what they don't know. Um, and I'll give you an example. So in the case of uh, uh, Phil Brennan, um, officers didn't know. So Phil Brennan, he, had, he was likely psychotic at the time that he was killed. And psychosis means you either are, you have a, any of your five senses, you perceive things in, within any of those five senses that aren't part of the consensus reality. Or you have, or you believe things that aren't part of the consensus reality. Um, and but one of the one of the things about psychosis um, that I learned from personal experience and also that's in the literature is that people who are psychotic have um, altered sensory phenomena, right? And so you can. When I was psychotic, I could hear things. If somebody were whispering 15 feet away from me, it sounded like they were yelling in my ear. I could hear it very clearly. Um, I could listen to music if I could tolerate it, and I could hear in a jazz, and I was a huge jazz fan. I could hear every single instrument clearly as if it were being played on its own. So why is that relevant? Well, and when, when the police officers were in Mr. Grennan's apartment, they didn't have a staging area. They talked about what they were going to do to get him out of his apartment within 10 feet of him, thinking that he couldn't hear them. They were ignorant of the fact that people, like people who have psychosis have extraordinary hearing. And he likely heard every single thing that he, they were saying. And the things that they were saying were not the things that were going to get him to come out of his room. Now, most people don't know that. Police officers haven't been trained that people who are in a psychotic state or a manic state have altered social <laughs> phenomenon and have extraordinary hearing, can have extraordinary strength. Um, uh, and so I think that's just an example of how that lack of knowledge, and lack of knowledge because they were trained by people who lacked the knowledge, um, interfered with that police action um, that night. And so I feel like this piece of legislation is going down that same path of uh, designating people as stakeholders to create a model policy who don't have all the information that they need to create this model policy because they don't know what they don't know. And so I think one of the things that would improve this legislation would actually to think more deeply about, well, who should, uh, who are the stakeholders who might bring some knowledge to this endeavor that we can't even think of because we are so unconscious about what we don't know. Um, the, um, the other thing I, I think this legislation could benefit from is maybe some legislative findings about exactly what you're trying to achieve, um, particularly um, what values uh, we're trying to uh, advance. Because you say develop a, you a, you're asking police officers to develop a model policy. Well, I think the policy that police officers might come up and consider a model may not reflect the largest societal values. I mean, a, a, or, or what we expect from police officers. I hear so often when police officers, you know, sh shoot for, you know, use use of force, um, lethal use of force in the line of duty, 
you know, late people will say, well, why didn't you just shoot him in the knee? Or why didn't you just shoot the thing out of the, your hand? Ignorant of the fact that treat police officers are trained to shoot at, you know, the biggest body mass. But we watch so much television, we, you know, we have a completely different conception about what is reasonable use of force. And so I think that we, as a, as a community, need to communicate to our law, law enforcement what is it that we value, right? We had a person who had a mental illness who was threatening to kill himself standing on the side of the road with a gun pointed at his head. And he was shot by a law enforcement officer. And I read the newspaper account where the representative of law enforcement said that police officers don't have to feel like their lives are in danger before they shoot, you know, to kill, which came as a complete shock to me. Um, I just shouldn't, I would never have guessed that it would have been within the uh, pro appropriate use of force for a police officer to kill a person who was threatening to kill himself. Um, and I think this kind of disconnect between what our community thinks of appropriate use of force and what police officers are trained um, as appropriate use of force causes a lot of conflict and misunderstanding. So I'm concerned that without legislative findings or without a statement of our values in this legislation, that a model police policy on use of force uh, would only reflect um, what police officers um, have been trained historically constitutes an appropriate use of force. Um, I've been talking nonstop. Are there any questions? <laughs> I want to take my breath. Bye. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having um, you know, Part of the process, we're, we're just seeing this now, too. Uh, and what would be helpful as we start to process this is if you have notes that you could share with us, that would be a helpful part for us to be able to inject into the process as we continue to. Uh, I don't know if you have notes now. I don't have them, but I will. I, I, I typically, if I don't bring them with me, I follow up my testimony with uh, written. That'd be great. And I will do that in this case, too. Yeah, thanks. Laura? The report that you're about to issue, can we get that? Yes. Electronically? Yes. If you could send that to our committee assistant, that, then, then we could have it. I'd be interested in reading it. I will do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Robin and Hal. Um, <clears throat> thank you for today. You're welcome. I will have to say when I did that yesterday, I had some of the very same questions. In fact, I asked them where sports and mental health component to this. Because um, that did seem to be a huge part for me. And, same question about some of the stakeholders is, you know, what are they bringing to the discussion here? Um, a question I have for you, though, is, you know, you were talking about the training for law enforcement. And I've actually heard that a little bit myself as well. But one of the comments that I'd heard made was that <clears throat> they, have, they, they have to get an awful lot of training. And... <clears throat> The concern is, is that they're going to get some of this training, whether it be a four-hour or whatever it turns out to be, and then they're going to be faced with this situation and have to make an immediate assessment. I mean, one of what, where this person is, whether they're in crisis, if it's a mental health crisis or whatever, and then two, are they going to have enough training to really be able to, one, make that assessment that quickly, and then two, decide a course of action that's appropriate? Is that a reasonable thing to expect, do you think? I don't think that they can get it all from uh, a four-hour training. I think it comes from uh, repetition. And, but it also has to, it, at, there also has to be some post-encounter uh, critique. So, so what we found, or um, I'm going to just speak personally right now since our, our report hasn't been um, released. So what I found um, in the Grinning case was um, you know, the Burlington Police Department, they engaged in a, you know, a, a, a post-incident critique. But here again, they don't know what they don't know. And so they uncovered nothing. None of the reasons, I think, that this happened. Um, you know, they didn't know that he could hear them or he might have been able to hear them. They didn't know how loud they were speaking. Um, um, they never even figured out that um, Phil Grennan the reason he acted the way he acted was um, he was he thought the police were coming to his apartment to kill him. He had told his psychiatrist that a week in advance. 
that I think the police are coming to my apartment to kill me, and if they do, I'm going to defend myself with knives. A letter was found in his apartment after he died saying that the police are going to come to my apartment and kill me on March 18th. Well, they killed him on March 21st. Um, Burlington Police Department never did any investigation to figure that out, even though they did a complete debrief you know, of this incident. And so I think what happens is uh, training is not enough, and then uh, when they make a mistake and they go in and they do these internal debriefings, they don't have the right people in the room to help them sort through uh, what they could have done better. And that, I mean, we learn the most from our failures. Um, and so uh, if you don't have more than just the same people in the room who were in the incident trying to help you sort it through, you're not going to learn anything. Um, and I think that's one of the valuable things about this commission I'm on because um, we have extensively reviewed uh, that encounter and we, every videotape, every sworn statement, talked to every, you know, all witnesses. Um, and we uncovered so much more than any of those other in individual um, organizations involved could have done on their own or did on their own. So I think it requires, um, you asked about, is this training enough? No. Uh, what more is required? I think post-incident reviews that involve more than just the people who are involved in that review. Um, and it requires, and the tr tr repetitive training with different scenarios that are critiqued by not just law enforcement officers. Um, I know I've been involved in some of the, uh, I've been invited to the police academy to talk to officers about um, uh, mental illness. Um, and, you know, I feel like I have been underutilized in that endeavor because I come, they, they sit there and they listen to somebody talk before I come in. Every time I come in, there's a PowerPoint slide that's up that I think, oh my God, that's what they've been taught, you know? Um, and then I give my little personal story, um, which might have some utility, but there's ways that I could be way more involved and more, way more helpful to these officers um, if I were just utilized. And so I think they need um, that utilization. And one of the things I personally think that had an impact on uh, Phil Brennan's death, and this is, this is not been shared by the, the commission, but it's my personal view, is the role of unconscious bias against people with mental illnesses um, in, 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 that played out there. Um, because I think when you have these unconscious biases, you don't, first of all, fear is usually operating, and we never make good decisions when we're afraid. Um, and then they have a stereotypical view of people with mental illnesses that they see on TV that's really not just stereotypical. It, it very rarely plays out um, uh, in reality. Um, and you, you become less patient. You think that it doesn't matter if you, or you think it, it won't be effective if you spend a little extra time to try to engage with the person, or you think engagement is not possible. Um, and, and that's a, you know, who do you, I, I think another way to address unconscious bias is actually including more people in the process who, um, uh, to counter those stereotypes. Um, you know, often, you know, every time I go to the, the police, it's the police academy and talk about um, my experience, um, they all want to say I don't have a mental illness. Um, because I don't, just simply because I don't meet the stereotype. Um, and, and what we need to try to get them to, to understand is that nobody meets the stereotype, um, or very few do. Um, and that everybody, you know, any time that you go, what I want them to believe and what I say to them is every time you go when there's a person with them uh, you think is, has a mental illness, I want you to think of them as me, who you thought, um, you know, couldn't have a mental illness. That's who you, that's who, that's who you're, that's who, that's who's there. That's me, you know. Uh, they're at their worst, uh, but they have a better. And you can help them, you know, get to that. Um, if, if you, if you try to manage your fear, uh, read the signs. Uh, but they need a lot more training, and particularly in the mental health field, they need a lot more training. And the training cannot come from, um, the, the typical stakeholders, because they just don't know. 
um, they need to try to involve more people who have experience of mental illness or mental health crisis, particularly if they call involved police officers during that um, and they've lived to talk about it. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Brandon Shaw. Sure. Thanks for being here. Um, so in terms of the way the bill reads today, what do you think is the most important element that, that comes out of the bill? What should be its focus? Um, or is there something that's missing in terms of what the focus should be? I think legislative findings are missing because it, it's always helpful to people to know what, we, what your role was when you wrote the legislation, what the connection between your findings and the particular provisions in the legislation. And right now, I don't see that. For example, I don't know, you say cross-cultural awareness policy. Do you think lack of cross-cultural awareness is what's causing you know, excessive use of force? I'm not convinced that that's the reason, perhaps, but you haven't made any findings to tell me that. I don't even know what a cross-cultural awareness policy is. I've never seen one. Um, and I don't even know if the people you've charged with doing this will know what a cross-cultural awareness policy is. So I think there's a <clears throat> lack of legislative findings, there's lack of definitions, there's lack of connections between a problem you're trying to solve that's not clearly identified here and the solutions that you've proposed. Um, and I think the lack of uh, the, the stakeholders that you're identified are insufficient to get to where I want to go. Um, and I think the um, the inter there's an intersection. When I told you that people with mental illnesses, particularly untreated mental illnesses, are uh, 16 times more likely to be killed by police, I mean it's even higher if the person is black. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's completely missing um, from yeah. this. Um, this, this legislation, figuring out how to um, uh, address kind of almost the intersection of race and, and mental illness. Kind of Go ahead, yes. So in terms of stakeholders, who do you think is missing? Um, uh, it, there's nothing in here about mental uh, illness, um, and I don't want, and I don't think the Vermont Human Rights Commission is the, is um, has any ability in this area whatsoever. Um, and I, the Vermont Legal Cities and Towns, likewise, the Executive Director of Racial Equity, who I don't know, um, but that's certainly not within her bailiwick. Um, but there's not, I would like to see you know, advocacy organizations, Vermont psychiatric survivors, or uh, people who've expressed an interest in um, the, this area, both kind of the mental illness and, uh, and race, or just mental illness. Uh, but there, there are several advocacy organizations on behalf of people with mental illnesses in the state. There are groups who are trying to figure out um, what to do about use of force when it comes to mental illness, um, they're missing. And I'm, I'm always a big believer in just citizens um, and not people who are being paid to do it, but people who are just, we live in this society, we live in this community, and we want to make it better. Um, and so I always would like to see slots reserved for people who step up because they're interested um, and they have something to offer. Uh, one of the things that's most challenging for people who've been labeled with mental illnesses is this, this thing of, of epistemic injustice, which probably none of you have heard of. Um, but epistemic injustice is when uh, people, because of prejudice, um, don't have the opportunity to uh, participate in knowledge creation. Um, there's, uh, there's two forms of epistemic injustice, and I've just described what's called hermeneutical um, injustice. And hermeneutical, hermeneutics is, uh, means the science of interpretation. And what happens when groups, <clears throat> particularly marginalized groups, are not uh, allowed to participate in the creation of knowledge, that knowledge doesn't get created. Um, things like I just told you about the, the altered sensory phenomenon of people who are in psychosis hit. So you, you probably would never see that um, because we don't get to speak. No one listens to us. And when we speak, they don't believe us. 
But there's so much, you know, epistemic injustice that goes on when it comes with people with mental illnesses and people in, in many marginalized communities, women, uh, black people, um, uh, that, that we don't get to speak. And so this is an opportunity to challenge epistemic injustice uh, by allowing those groups who are traditionally marginalized to speak and contribute what they know. Because we know not only what our experiences are, being labeled with mental illnesses, but we also know what it is to live in this world. So we come with more than just our lived experience of mental illness. We come with our lived experience of mental illness coupled with our lived experience of living in a world that marginalizes us. Uh, we, we come with knowledge of the dominant culture and knowledge of that marginalized culture. And, and I think we have lots to contribute that if people would just give us an opportunity, um, I think it would make for, it, it, would, it, it would improve these situations. A couple years ago, we had a conference, a group of uh, uh, organizations in, that work in this area of mental illness. And we had Madeline Cunin speak as our keynote. Um, and one of the things she shared with us that, um, I think she was quoting somebody else, but I'll, I will quote whoever she was quoting now, where she said, people who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Um, so I think you need to involve more people who are close to the problem. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So one of the things that you um, that you pointed out is that the, the language in 464 that's in front of us talks about implicit bias um, in, in the context of race. Um, but that there is also implicit bias for um, folks who are experiencing a, a mental health crisis. And uh, I'm really struck by your um, sort of vision that, um, that one-time training is not enough. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if you can imagine uh, a way that there could be more of a continuous evaluation of incidents and uh, and training um, and retraining of law enforcement in a way that would um, would help uh, foster better understanding of the many different kinds of um, mental health crises that that people might encounter. Well, the one I think I've alluded to one of them is it's just after you have a, an incident, invite more, invite members of the community in during your debriefing, as part of your debriefing, um, you know, offering them uh, access to the same uh, evidence that you have and asking, you know, for their opinions. And so that's just, that's, that, that goes, that, that, you know, kind of uh, addresses a couple things. One is it helps with your community um, relations because you're reaching out to the community, you're, you're getting to know people who, 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 who possibly have been in mental health crisis when they're at their desk. So I think familiarity um, helps with unconscious biases. Um, and then I think the, you know, the continued support of the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission is good because I think, um, and I hope this is shared when the report's released, I think there's some trepidation about it because um, you know, we don't want to upset people, but we also want to be helpful. Um, but continuing support of that process where we actually review um, these uh, killings and make rec recommendations. Mm -hmm. But I think it has to happen on a community level where you please, uh, please invite community in to um, revisit these. And also when they audit their trainings, because I think, uh, I think police officers are being trained to do things that aren't helpful. One of, the, one of the main tools of a police officer is command presence. But command presence does not typically work when a person is in the throes of psychosis. One of, one, first of all, when you're psychotic, you know, like I tell you, some, some people, they cannot tolerate noise. They can't, or loud noises. So you're yelling at them, that's just going to agitate them. Um, and uh, so, they, you know, so there needs to be some kind of audit of auditing of that training by people who know the population um, that these interventions are intended for, um, just so that we're not doing things that are, are harmful. But I think it has to be on the on the community level. More tools in the toolbox. Yeah, different tools, <laughs> different tools in the in the in the toolbox. Any questions, Kim? 
it's still seconds. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, along that lines, and <clears throat> you, you really did a nice job and certainly made me think about some stuff, but uh, when you, an officer's in that situation and you've got just mere seconds, uh, does it matter what the motivation is of the, you know, the party that you're interacting with? If, if you're fearing for your life or somebody else's, and I'm not sure what all the criteria here that they have to, that comes into play there, but do they really have the time to go through that sort of thought process? Yeah. If it's, I mean, if somebody's pulling a, you've identified that somebody's pulling a firearm or a knife out at you, mm -hmm. that's an entirely different situation than somebody that's reaching for their club compartment or reaching into their pocket. And it's frequent that those sort of actions result in death also. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I mean, these things are very puzzling for me and I have no sure. answer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think also the, the reaction is directly related to whether or not that person's white or black. So implicit bias is always at work. So if you're not aware of it, you can't manage it. Yeah. So if you could take a few more seconds, you might be able to go, oh, right. that's actually an undercover black officer <laughs> versus you know a thug and I'm gonna shoot him. Yeah, but like, see these two scenarios here that we're talking about, I, I don't, neither one of them were a person of color, were they? The gentleman in the shower, the one who walked out, he said a shovel? I don't know the guy with the shower, the shovel guy was like, okay. Because, you know, and, and mental illness was history. the stereotype in those cases. Pardon me? But the, mental illness was the stereotype in yes, those cases. Yes, yes. So the implicit bias, once again, is what that worked. Okay. And it's comfort. Mm -hmm. And the sad reality is that many times when our local law enforcement are interacting with people who are in a mental health crisis, these are people that they have probably already interacted mm -hmm. with. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I know in my community, you know, there's there's some folks who frequently have abnormal behavior in public, and uh, and you know citizens might call the police and you know there might not be anything dangerous going on most of the time but police are already aware that, that you know this person has uh, has exhibited different behavior and um, so you know I think I think if we can just put put our brains in the mindset of um, is there something that we can do to um, to help bend the landscape so that there's a greater understanding of implicit bias as well as explicit bias. Um, and, you know, the word de-escalation is in the title of the bill. You know, are there, are there more tools that can be given to, uh, to train for police officers that will help, uh, help them go to that tool if it's appropriate? So. Um, I welcome anyone who's sitting around the room or any committee members to, to stick around and chat about who you would like to hear from either on Tuesday or if we come back to this uh, here in this committee. Um, Tuesday we'll be sitting with the Judiciary Committee because they happen to be um, assigned H808, um, but because they're these are two related issues. We, we probably will end up um, taking possession of 808, but I thought it would be helpful for us to hear from the judiciary perspective um, as we consider that.